from the Joint Capital Planning Committee meeting of Thursday, April 25th, 2019, to order at 8.30 a.m. And welcome, everyone. Um, and uh, we're going to uh, follow the order of the agenda and uh, um, start with the uh, report from the Community Preservation Act Committee. And welcome uh, Nate Buddington, who's the chair of the committee. And uh, he's uh, going to briefly walk us through the um, CPAC recommendations. And then we probably will want to have a little bit of a discussion about the relationship between CPAC and Joint Capital Planning Committee. Um, but I think it's important to start to hear about their work of the year. So, Nate. Thank you. Uh, I know you have a full agenda, so uh, just let me know how you want me to do this. I can go through these uh, relatively quickly and take questions at the end if you have any, or I can take questions as the proposals are described, whatever you'd prefer. Um, why don't you just uh, briefly, because uh, okay. a couple of us were here yesterday and heard to a different committee which pre what the report was, but there are a number of people um, who are not. And uh, so um, okay. i go through it quickly and um, especially uh, covering the items that are also were submissions from the, some part of the town okay. um, or schools, library. But you want me to go through all of them? Okay. Yes. So let, we can start with community housing. Uh, there was a $400,000 request from the Municipal Affordable Housing Trust to begin the process of planning for the conversion of the East Street School into affordable housing. Um, we awarded uh, half the amount requested, uh, $200,000. The Valley um, CDC requested $500,000 for their studio apartment supportive housing project. They've purchased a property on Route 9 near the Amherst College football stadium uh, and will add an addition onto this house to create about 28 units of studio apartment um, single occupancy housing for some of the most vulnerable people, vulnerable folks in our community, the people emerging out of homelessness, uh, people who've been working with the State Department of Mental Health, um, very low income, very moderate income people who've been uh, struggling to find housing. Uh, Amherst Community Connections uh, requested a hundred and, little over 116,000 for a program that they've been doing for a couple of years now. We, this is the third year we've supported it. And it is a program that, cr that uh, uh, gives housing vouchers to uh, the chronically homeless in Amherst and helps them transition to being self-supporting with um, a number of different counseling programs that, that they run. And they've been working with some local landlords to find uh, uh, in-town uh, housing uh, for folks involved in this program. So those were the three community housing proposals that we approved at CPA. Yes, Lynn has a question. And the reason I didn't ask it yesterday is because I'm not officially a member of that committee that met yesterday. Um, just going back to the one from Community Connections, how much is each event and how many people do they serve per year and what kind of evaluation have you received from them on the impact of their program? Uh, I think they're awarding three to four a year. Uh, do you know? Yeah, so um, we might be getting confused a little bit with the details of the other proposal that they withdrew for the phase three. Uh, this is six rental subsidies of uh, f up to about $400 per month. There's one other thing I should note on this, and I'll just say it really quickly so that we can go on, because uh, there was a, a question that arose in a prior year about this particular program, because it has both a social services component of providing social services assistance to the people who they're providing housing for and the actual housing part of it. And uh, 
we did some investigation and came to a conclusion that it's not appropriate to use Community Preservation Act money for social service programming, but um, it is for housing programming. And uh, when I looked at the budget that they submitted, um, the um, social services part of it is being supported by other funds that they have available. And so they're asking um, the CPAC program, uh, CPA program to only pick up the housing part. Right, I, I, I should have mentioned that, that our, this is a more of a comprehensive program, but our contribution is for the housing vouchers. Yeah, Mandy. So I apologize, I have a question on each of the three programs, a couple of questions. So I, I will start with the ACC one since that's where we are. Um, it goes sort of to Lynn's. This is a similar to a program that's already been supported for two years or so by CPA funds, it Correct. sounds like. So have you as a CPA committee been able to receive sort of those results from the last two years of support to see whether the rental support is accomplishing the goal of what the ACC has said the goal is, is to move them to higher incomes and out into so that they don't need to continue that rental support. Um, are those questions you've asked? And if so, what are those answers so that we know that this is an effective program that, to support with taxpayer dollars? It's a great question, and it's one that we've wrestled a little bit with on the committee because there doesn't appear to be a really organized mechanism to have an outside evaluation to this program, and we've been relying to some extent on a kind of self-evaluation and a report from the um, Amherst Community Connections itself. And I think um, to some extent our concern about that is aligned with a concern that CPA seems to be um, the first in line funder three years in a row for this project. And I think there's some resistance for us being kind of consistent year to year budget support for a particular agency. Um, so we, for, for that reason, I, I, I don't want to speak for the committee, but I'm guessing if this comes up next year, there'll be um, uh, much more resistance to being a, a sort of annual funder to this program. But your question is a good one. We don't really have a mechanism for getting a, a really rock solid evaluation of the effectiveness of this program. What they have reported has assured us enough that it's worth uh, supporting. Yeah. Eric. Hi, good morning. Um, I just feel like I have a stupid question, but I love stupid questions. Um, the, the, on, on this very item, the, the total amount requested is $116,000, and the, the, the services description underneath it is for uh, rental subsidies up to $400 per month with six overall uh, households being helped. And if my math is right, that, mean, that comes out to uh, a little less than a quarter of the money, or around a quarter of the money, something like that. And then, uh, less than a quarter of the money. And I was just curious what the rest of the money was for. This is a staggered three-year program. Is that right, Anthony, how this is funded? I'm looking for it right now. Yeah. She did submit a budget. So it's not really just an FY20. It's not a single year. It's not just an FY20 amount. It's awarded this year, but it will cover for three years. Okay. I believe that's the funding. This is, oh, you can't read that. Um, so this is, this is the budget they submitted. And yes, it's multiple years. And there, there is a portion as you look at that for management in addition to no, knowing that it's for three years helps enormously. Yeah. I assume there was some overhead to it, but you'd, ne you'd never have like 80% overhead to a program. Right. Yeah, no, it's, um, it is because it's three years. 
Yeah, Mandy, did you have anything else? Not on ACC. I've got some on East Street School and Valley CDC project. Okay, anything else on um, the uh, Amherst Community Connections? Matt, go ahead. So I'll, I'll move to the East Street School. I wasn't completely clear on what this is for, given what the town council voted on the East Street School project. The town council, I thought, voted to transfer the property, allow the transfer of the, you know, sort of the property, the building rights to a private developer. And this request seems to be for the housing trust to be the developer. So I guess I'm confused as to what the housing trust's money is for if the housing trust is sending out RFPs to have that property developed privately. The housing trust has requested, this is the second year in a row, to have money awarded to them. And the previous request was based on the awkwardness of the calendar with CPA regarding town meeting, where we only met once. That they wanted money on hand to give them the flexibility um, to be able to make uh, investments in planning uh, for the E Street property uh, without having to come back to us when we couldn't align with the town meeting calendar. That is less of an issue now with the town council. Um, but they wanted to be able to have the flexibility to have funds when needed somewhat undesignated, but mostly based on, on things like planning for the project. I don't know how it relates to the money that was allocated by the town council. Yeah, I, I think my suggestion on this would be, it's, it's a good question that you're raising, but the, to try and focus today on the interrelationship to the Joint Capital Planning Committee, but that, um, because ultimately the vote on um, CPA proposals is a vote of the council, uh, that that's an issue that needs to be taken up um, by the council and its finance committee. And we should be asking the uh, Affordable Housing Trust to come back and make a fuller explanation of the whole mechanism and how those two pieces fit together. Okay. And <clears throat> so, in your, can I ask something about Valley CDC? It, it might be better for Councilor. Um, one of the questions I had was with this mental health, social work type support. Um, Valley CDC, I think, intends the SRO project to have some sort of social worker and mental health support there, is this money going to that or has it been split out? Well, there's, there's a number of series of, there's a number of sources of money for this project, which will be considerably more than 500,000. So we're contributing to the, to the overall project. Um, I think that the uh, other aspect of this one that actually does relate to JCPC, yes, Sonia, before I go on to the other part. CPA funds can't be used for social type services. So uh, all CPA is reimbursement, so they have to submit invoices to the town in order for us to reimburse them up to the $500,000. If there's anything on there that has to do with social services, it will be disallowed. So there is some checks and balances in this. And for the Affordable Housing Trust, that is a municipal, Town of Amherst Municipal Housing Trust. So that all goes through the town's treasury as well, and it's well um, audited and checks and balances on that. So it would have to be for a legitimate housing. The um other aspect that does relate very much to this uh, committee, and I had brought this up yesterday at the, uh, at the uh, Community Resources Committee meeting, but saying that it really belonged in a different place, so I didn't pursue it there, <clears throat> is that it's to, um, a proposal um, to borrow money and then to um, 
actually um, repay it, as has been done in previous years, um, in future with future years CPA funds, and uh, because we know from uh, the work that we've been doing on planning for long-term capital, um, there is a limit to the amount that the town can borrow, a statutory limit of 5% of the EQV of the town, the total property values. Um, and as we're looking at uh, the uh, requests that we're going to be getting from uh, major capital projects, uh, we do need to be very conscious of where we are against uh, the town's borrowing limit and to the effect that that has an impact on long-term capital planning of the town that gets us back very into this committee's role very clearly. And uh, so can you tell us a little bit about um, what the request is on and why the, um, the borrowing is a uh, necessary component of the proposal? Well, we went into this <coughs> this year realizing we had about, uh, you know, 1.7 million to spend and uh, requests totaling much more. And we had two very big housing proposals. Um, so we were pretty vigilant in um, vetting these proposals. We rejected a number of proposals and part of that was rejecting them on, on the face of it, that they just weren't appropriate. But also keeping in mind that we really, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we realized the very issue you're bringing up was in front of us. Uh, at the end of the day, we, um, we felt these were exceptionally good proposals. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we have borrowed more than this at times. We've borrowed less than this at times. Sometimes we haven't borrowed any. Uh, we just felt this studio apartment, in particular, this proposal was kind of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to address in a pretty profound way the most vulnerable people in Amherst. We thought it was worth the borrowing. These are 28 units, which is significant. Is that what you were asking for? Kind of yeah, a rationale for it is. It's helpful. I think that uh, in the end, we're going to have to rely on Mr. Mangano and Ms. Aldridge to give us some advice on that subject, and then to, through I mean, the Finance Committee and JCPC to give the council advice on the subject. So, that, but um, I, I wanted to make the uh, because we have representatives of the. Um, school committee and the library trustees here who have an investment, so to speak, in the uh, process that we're talking about, about a long-term plan and the borrowing capacity against that's needed to fund the long-term plan that and needed to bring this up to get it to the attention of the library trustees and the school committee. One thing I would say is I would hope that uh, rather than simply if this comes up, rejecting the bonding proposal that we be given the opportunity to regroup and maybe reorganize proposals. There was uniform excitement about this particular project. I think probably more than anything else we considered this year. It's helpful. Thank you. Anything else on housing? So for historical preservation, um, there's a preservation plan update process that the Historical Commission uh, uses on a regular basis. Uh, they like to get it done every five years. That's the recommendation. We haven't done one in 13 years. And uh, this allows us to kind of do an update on our preservation needs and planning work, um, getting more income uh, comment from the public, and just sort of do an in inventory of, of needs. And we're way out of date with, with doing a preservation plan. So we wanted to support that. 
the continuing effort to uh, improve the condition of some of the gravestones in the West Cemetery. This is a, a, a phase two. We funded a previous phase. This is to uh, fix and uh, repair a number of damaged headsto headstones uh, of some of historical importance, some of just importance because they needed to be needed to be repaired. Uh, the farmhouse window restoration. This is the, the farmhouse down in uh, North Amherst at Simple Gifts Farm. We uh, funded last year a, a uh, exterior repair of that building. And this is a second request to um, use historic windows uh, in, in the exterior of the building to refurbish the existing windows that are historic uh, wooden windows. And this will, I believe, repair all the windows in the building. We also approved uh, Amherst Historical Society's data migration project. This is to take what currently exists sort of an inventory of uh, items that are in the collection that are on an Excel spreadsheet to a, a more um, open source system where these will be available to be viewed by the public, by scholars. It's a much more modern, up-to-date system of uh, managing collections. Is this a one-time cost, or would it have um, future um, I believe it's a one-time cost. Uh, in open space, uh, the town had requested uh, $50,000 for improvements to uh, existing uh, lands, public lands, as you may know if you use them. Uh, there's some pretty serious degradation of trails and bridges in our public lands. Um, we, because of how much money we had to operate with, uh, we did not approve the $50,000 request, but we requested 10 and recommended that the town come back to us at a later date. The Zala property was a $188,000 request. This is an interesting piece of property that exists as sort of a donut hole where Route 116 and Sunderland Road meet just west of there. There are two conservation lands that have a, 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 an interruption in the middle of it, uh, and this is the Zala property. This property would be able to, if purchase would create a uh, sort of an entire uh, north-south rectangle of preserved land. This is important wetlands. There's been moose in this land. Uh, it's ripe for development, the eastern section of it, so we do want to protect not much development, maybe a couple of housing lots, but we do want to protect that agricultural land and include the land that would allow this, uh, this north-south split to be contiguous. Just west of this land is a very large Hadley uh, uh, agricultural reserve. So this would create on the Hadley, straddling the Hadley Amherst line, a pretty uh, sizable piece of protected land. Uh, the Hickory Ridge property acquisition is uh, we would be, uh, CPA money would be used for the part of the Hickory Ridge golf course that would be used as recreation open space. Uh, this is a piece of land that is both beautiful, uh, it is right in the middle of two of the most densely populated parts of Amherst. Uh, and it is, because it's been set up as a golf course, it has trails and bridges that would make this without an awful lot of work, almost upon purchase, uh, a, a park that is handicap accessible. There is a section of this land that would not be purchased with CPA money. This is where the clubhouse is and the parking lot and the, the area around Pomeroy. That, that's parallel to Pomeroy that could be used, will be purchased with other funds, uh, but could be used for affordable housing, reuse of the clubhouse. CPA lands are, funds are just being used to preserve uh, the, the Fort River buffer zone, if you will, and the meadows to the north. Uh, the Keat Haskins property is another pretty remarkable piece of property. This is the Cushman Brook area that, that feeds um, Puffer's Pond. This is sort of an area between Market Hill Road and um, I think it's Shootsbury Road or North Leverett Road. Or, um, 
This is an area that is under threat of development, and this purchase of this land would, would we basically have at the end result, because of other protected lands, a two mile protected corridor on the Cushman Brook, which is something that I believe has been part of the master plan to, um, to purchase this land. CPA has a bias toward proposals that bring in uh, matching grants, and this proposal is bringing in a $400,000 land grant. So we're pretty excited about the, the cost, uh, the, the participation in a project with a, with a uh, pretty big matching grant. I have one question about the land, um, the Hickory Ridge. If there's no land being purchased along Pomeroy, how does a handicapped person access that trail? That land will be purchased, but it won't be purchased with CPA funds. So the, the so access to that would be through Pomeroy to the that would be part of this whatever they're going to call it the Hickory Ridge Park or open okay. space would be the the meadows to the north and the river way, and it would also be the land that you're referring to, but CPA would not be purchasing that part of the okay. property. But access to what CPA is purchasing would be through that property once it's correct, and possibly to the north where the uh, apartment complexes are. There, there will probably be, uh, interestingly, this okay. is the one part of the property where there's a fence is between the golf from course. From East Hadley Road, I mean, yeah. from that yeah. direction. Okay. okay, thank you. I wanted to follow up on that. I'm just, maybe if, if you don't know, I don't know if members of the council know, who, who else is buying and putting up money to buy the rest of it? I'm just saying, it, it, since this is about a definite acquisition of this portion of the land, it makes one curious as to where specifically is the rest of the money coming from and who's doing it, and is that definite? Follows on sort of the question around access of if you were buying this land and you had access, and the question is it was speculative that you'd have access, then the question would be how would you know you definitely would have access? And so you'd want to know both pieces were locked down. And I'm just curious if that's public information or not. It's not. Yes, Sonia? Uh, I believe we don't have a definite plan yet on how it's all going to be purchased. I'm sure there'll be grant funding involved, applications going out. This money won't be spent until the whole package is put together. So I'm sure that will all come out and go through a long pr public process. I just don't think they're there yet. I will follow up with Dave Zomek and see if there is more information and get it to you. Great. So essentially, this is, this is obviously a critical piece of the puzzle and the whole puzzle is being put together, but it's good to have this locked down as you're proceeding with the rest of it. Mandy? So I had a question about the land improvement and rehab that you reduced from 50. This is one that came to JCPC2 as sort of a multi, and I personally see it as more of a CPA logical one, so I'm concerned about that reduction um, because as you stated in your presentation, these trails are need are in need of severe maintenance, yet you reduced the request by 80%. Um, and it is something that on the face of it to me looks like it would have wide, wide public benefit um, and public use because we use our trails in Amherst. So, um, how was the decision made to reduce that one by $40,000, um, but you know, say the Zala property, um, which I'm still not quite clear on where it is, um, but that one keep at its full request? Um, how do those decisions get made? Um, all of which a lot of times also come to JCPC land acquisition requests too. Um, so. Well, the, Why was that one chosen to be reduced, I well, guess? Well, the town was pretty clear with us that they were open to a reduced award and that they would come back to us next year. So it actually came from them, understanding that we had some pretty hard decisions to make. So we wanted to get this process going to do some of this trail and bridge repair. Um, but when, when, when a, when, in a time when we, we, we have to make some pretty tough, tough decisions, if, a, if someone who proposes something says, 
This year we can do with less money. We're going to take advantage of that offer. I also want to point out that um, all the respective committees are asked to prioritize their projects, so that helps the CPA make their decisions as well. Yeah, I think that the other thing to recognize is that um, when you've got land acquisition opportunities, sometimes time is of the essence, whereas um, some of the other things like the trail work if you postpone it for a year, you can do it next year. If you don't buy the Zala property, you may lose that opportunity. So uh, that, that, that's a factor that has to be worked in, and I think that when our staff provides advice to committees, it's sort of with that base of knowledge. A couple of recreation proposals. Uh, the Groff Park modernization proposal, $110,000. This is to complete the new playground uh, pavilion and water park that we've been funding for a couple of years. It's been a little bit of a frustrating process. I think the original, there was a grant that didn't come through. Uh, the original bid came in kind of high. Uh, so we've been going back to this project. This amount of money is money that may be coming back to us because it's to, it's to fund a 20% contingency fee on this project uh, to make sure we don't run into budget problems again as we try to complete this project, which has started, by the way. So this $110,000 is money that we may very well see returned to us if we don't use the contingency. Uh, the Mill River Recreation Area grant. Um, Mill River has gone through a number of improvements in the last couple of years, new tennis courts, some pretty significant improvements to the pool, uh, new baseball fields. But uh, the playground as it is is much too close to the baseball field. That creates a safety hazard. Uh, the basketball court is uh, in very, very bad shape and needs to be completely rebuilt. And the pavilion is not in great shape either. So this. Is the, be is the beginning of preparing for a park grant that will hopefully address all of those issues and effectively complete the rehabilitation of Mill River, which is now four years old, five years old, the project beginning the, the rehabilitation of, of Mill River. Andy. I just had a a question, if the money for the Graff Park ends up not being spent and coming back, is it then specifically reserved to be used on recreation only? Because otherwise, recreation might not hit its 10% limit this year. So I'm, I'm curious how that works. Recreation is, is the 10% is recreation and open space combined. So recreation doesn't have to meet the 10% threshold. So if it comes back, it could be used for any purpose, then it wouldn't have a specific reservation? Technically, the funds go back to where they were appropriated from. So if it came from the undesignated fund balance of CPA, that's where it goes back. If it came from one of the reserves, if we had reserves for housing or recreation or open space, it would go back to that. And we appropriated from there, it would go directly back there. But when it's not designated into a reserve, then it just falls back to undesignated revenue. And we watch the 10%. We have to for state reporting, so. But to respend it, it has to go through the process again of the CPA committee right. making a recommendation and then the council acting on the recommendation. No, I, I get that. I guess I'm just concerned when you're looking at the splits. Many years the split goes well to affordable housing, and I'm not saying that's a problem, but if you're looking at this year one of the big projects for recreation, which has, you could argue, has a larger public benefit than affordable housing in terms of who gets to use it, um, just using it. and and. There's other arguments for affordable housing, so don't don't right. indicate that. But then it comes back, and 
the if the indicate you know if the inclination is to not then spend it on recreation that that just concerns me um, because those recreation requests would be in JCPC's hands if they're not being funded by CPA. Mm -hmm. So I just want to watch out for the split too. I think in a general sense of the way the committee operates, there's a real interest in maintaining that balance beyond just simply meeting the minimum 10% threshold. Yes. I just want to um, add to that a little. There's no reason why we couldn't internally come up with a way for the funding, if it was voted for um, recreation, for it to fall back to recreation. However, that's like a two-edged sword because the money might, something might come up with um, recreation that we need more money for and we don't have it and we can't use it because the affordable housing project um, tanked and it went back into the affordable housing and our process is not to do that. So I think, I think that would tie our hands too much. Other than administrative expenses, that's, uh, that's our expenditures this year. Other questions about the report, and then I would, uh, did you have something, Sonia? Or? Okay. Because the other question that I think that we ought to really spend a couple of moments thinking about is whether anybody has any suggestion, concerns about the amount of communication between the two committees and suggestions about next year um, if there's things that they would that could be done differently to have communication earlier. Yeah, Lynn? First of all, I think both with JCPC and CPAC, uh, several people on the council have suggested they'd like to see us move this forward in earlier in the year so there's more of an opportunity for a dialogue between uh, the two and doesn't feel as compressed. This year, that just the change in government just didn't allow that. And um, that's one of the issues. And then the other issue that I think, um, a couple, just speaking for myself, I'm focused on is anything that commits to our debt and uh, the extent to which where as we look at our large capital projects, um, the extent to which we um, commit other debt as well. Andy? And I, I guess I would love to have some sort of real dialogue when projects come to CPA with JCPC. Um, since CPA money is taxpayer money and, you know, JCPC has a lot more flexibility in what we obviously fund, um, my personal view of CPA is if a project could be, falls under a CPA, that might be where the priority of funding it comes from so that that opens up JCPC money for projects that can't be funded by CPA. Um, and so having that dialogue about, you know, like this trail thing came to both of us, having that dialogue earlier on what might get funded, what might not, and the reasons for maybe reducing those requests in CPA and priorities and both would, would be very beneficial, I think, to both committees as we're looking at what do we pick to fund and the thinking on, well, maybe CPA is not gonna fund it this year because of these others, but it's a high priority for say next year. And so we don't have to necessarily put it on our side of the 10 year capital. And I think those conversations need to happen earlier in the process than later. We've often said the same thing on CPA as we wish we knew what JCPC was doing. <laughs> so this makes good sense. <clears throat> Yeah, Eric. Um, I, you, you, I guess based on what I'm seeing here, we got a request on for <coughs> Cherry Hill and some potential improvements to Cherry Hill, and I guess that that was not brought to the the CPA. That's correct. And I think it, this isn't really I, when you talk about me, the two committees meeting or having better communication. 
Um, this isn't really directed to anything in the CPA report, although I think it probably echoes some of the, the, the thinking around trail maintenance and things like that, that one of the things that, this is my second year doing JCPC, and it's hard not to start to think about and get worried about more broadly in the town, but including our, our historic, cultural, and recreational assets. Um, the, the amount of money we're able to put into sort of new projects and new things versus the resources we're able to put into ongoing maintenance and capital replenishment of, of assets that are used durably. So it's not a new bright shiny thing, but it's something that in fact the community really relies upon. And as, as if you, whenever you look at it, when you take a look at some of the things that are gonna be coming out of the town's overall uh, capital budget for FY20 and for the next five years, it, one thing that leaps out, I think it should leap out to anyone who's paying attention, is we, we have lots and lots of core needs that are sort of backing up that are um, either, either buildings, equipment, or systems that are nearing the end of the usable life. And the question is, how do you balance out figuring out where you're gonna be able to find the money and when things are gonna end up failing? This is obviously a topic for later in our meeting in terms of the long range look. But in terms of the intersection with, with CPA, uh, it, CPAC is that, it, to me, the way, the better we as a town are able to think about the balance of how we're investing where we can um, before we have to, and looking out a few years to try to make sure that we're making investments every single year to chip away at maintenance and, and things that need to be just maintained, uh, seems to me to be really, really critical. And I think the challenge is, and it, you, look, you're wrestling with this all the time, and this is what you're doing, so I'm not, this isn't critical. But the challenge is precisely what you're talking about, the balance between finding new opportunities that are exciting, maybe one time, maybe really important, versus the fact that as a, as a town, we look at our overall budget, there are lots of things that we need to be doing better at that are just ongoing things we have that are, are nearing the end of their life and could pose some substantial either risk or erosion of uh, the usability of some of our assets over time. Yeah, Owen? I guess I, it's more of a practical question. I think we all agree that better coordination makes sense. And so Mandy's proposing that you, know, you meet earlier, but is that, I guess, is that realistic that you meet earlier and then present to us? Or does it, like, I guess I'm just trying to figure out like, how do we really figure out a coordinated approach? I don't know whether it's a liaison on either committee. I don't know whether, because I suspect you need to know what's going on with us as well as we need to know what's going on with you. And just having you meet earlier helps us, but probably doesn't help you. So um, again, not proposing solutions, just. <laughs> yeah, this was an exceptional year. And um, Nate actually did contact me early on because I had been the select board liaison to CPAC in prior years. And uh, the, uh, so he turned to me and said, should we go ahead and start our process? And actually there was, you know, a little bit of uncertainty as to when to get that process started. We ultimately, you know, I encouraged them to go ahead when they did, uh, but we need to be much more strategic in thinking through the um, timelines for all of our processes now because, you know, one of the things that we're now at is that with town meeting, they would only meet twice a year and everything had to fit in to town meeting schedule. Now we have a legislative body that meets throughout the year, and uh, therefore you're not, we're not bound by having to adhere to a town meeting cycle of calendar. And I think that it enables us to be more flexible for both committees and to find ways to do the scheduling that works together effectively. Uh, because of the transition happened in December, we didn't have the luxury of being able to spend time figuring that out. But that's what one of the things we need to talk about now is how we can do it 
what we, what we would suggest to do better next year so that we um, learn from the experience and um, take advantage of the fact that we are a year-round legislative body now. And in defense of Andy, I actually did attend a couple CPAC meetings when I was able to uh, as a liaison, but it was my first round with both JCPC and CPA, and so I was obviously on a huge learning curve and um, have not done the, as much input to proposals that I think in the past Andy has been able to do. So that's part of trying to do it earlier and literally that decision happened with my looking at Andy, Andy looking at me, Andy saying I can't take on anymore and my saying okay I'll do it. So it's not exactly the way we should do business in the future. Um, so. But having said that, I will also say that in the town council goals under um, budget and finance, we already have the goal of looking at both JCPC and CPAC uh, and their timeline. If I could just add, it would, if, if we are going to enter into some discussion on how to better coordinate, it would be my preference that we begin that sooner than later. So when we get to the beginning of the cycle next year, we really know what we're doing. And we may need, obviously need to make adjustments as we see how it works, but. I think the finance committee is thinking about doing that in June. So I think that, I'm not sure we can take it farther than that, but this has been very helpful. Is there any other questions or comments that people want to make about the PAC part of it, yeah, Lynn. Having said everything and all the questions we asked you and having attended several of your meetings, uh, they do an amazing job and provide an opportunity for uh, people to come before them and make their case in a way that, you know, we don't have the time, for instance, through town council or in most other situations, although we do that here. Uh, and it is in those meetings that you really get a chance to understand the uh, detailed nature and the thought of this. And you also understand why proposals are withdrawn and why proposals are rejected. So in none of this is meant to diminish the work of the committee, but to basically thank you for stepping to the plate so fast and so thoroughly this year. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I would echo that. I really do appreciate the um, work that was done, the um, hard work that was done by the entire committee and thoughtfulness of the proposals. And, uh, you know, we do need to learn a lot more um, throughout our council finance committee and this committee about the Valley CDC proposal how it is structured, what the funding mechanism is, why the, why the money is, um, what they envision using the money for, um, those kinds of things. And we may need to get Valley CDC to make a direct presentation so that we have, some, so that you don't have to get caught in the middle, being in the middle of that. Because, um, uh, you know, we don't know that whether or not it's going to be a bonding uh, capacity problem, and um, but if you know, are there alternatives? Um, how? What? What are the alternatives about where the money is coming from and how it's going to be spent over time? Uh, is this uh, a construction grant, for example, that has to be done all at once, or um, can it be spaced over time? In those are the things that, you know, I have no idea about. You might have a better sense, but, um, yes. So this is a question both to you here and to you as chair of finance and to the three of us as counselors. So the schedule right now for CPAC is um, that they will come before the finance committee on April 30th. And so if you want the finance committee have more information on the CDC project, that's one opportunity. And then the recommendations of three committees that I, um, 
that are reviewing CPAC recommendations that go to the council is on the May 6th agenda. And so again, um, now the council could decide not to take action that night, but if there's going to be a present presentation by any of these, like CDC, then it needs to be either then or at a scheduled time. Uh, so you're thinking that maybe they should attend the finance committee meeting? I think it might be helpful to have the LACDC, but that we can work that through our own staff. And uh, I don't know for sure, maybe somebody can quickly check, but that meeting may also be called as a committee of the whole, which is the entire council is able to come and discuss. It, I'm getting a yes it is. So, uh, and that's at, on April 30th at two o'clock in this room, and um, it, a committee of the whole means that any counselor who arrives, and um, I call a committee of the whole, they then can function as a regular part of the discussion and not sit as an audience. Okay. And I guess the, the one final thing, you turn to Sonia on this one, is, uh, there are provisions in the charter that require that on the capital budget and on the budget as a whole, the actions have to be taken by a specific time. And of course, that's because we have to have a budget by the beginning of the fiscal year. Uh, with uh, CPA, are there similar timelines that are statutorily set or does the council have more flexibility? And that's, you don't have to answer that now, but it would be helpful to know. I don't have the exact answer to that, but <clears throat> CPA um, funding is also based on estimated revenues. So it's also subject to the tax rate being set and all that, so I think there will be the same limitations where we have to have it voted before July 1st. Yeah. On another note, for all the um, questions and all the projects and everything, all of these uh, proposals are posted on the website, for CPA website, along with a, a comprehensive list of questions that were submitted to, the C to all the uh, proposers with their answers, and it, that's all there. So th th you could probably answer a lot of your questions right on the website. Good point. Okay. I'm sorry, Andy. Would you like um, CDC to come to our meeting on the 30th? I think we can, uh, we don't have to make that decision now. Okay, now. all right. <clears throat> um, but thank you very much, Nate, I appreciate it. So, um, going back to the agenda then, uh, I think this, the second item is the um, final review of the 10-year capital plan, and uh, that was an item that was sent to us by, uh, staff, uh, it is the chart, and I think, um, So, um, I don't know if you want to start by making comments to us. Yeah, so I was going to, Sonia and I were going to quickly go through the full plan and listing of projects and highlight some of the changes to the out years that we talked about. We tried to look at it a little closer and um, update those projects. And also all that is flowed through to the summary page, but if you go to the next page, so under equipment, I don't think there have been any major changes here. I think under fire, um, there was a comment last time about the protective gear, and we talked about that being an every year type expense on a schedule. Um, so we rolled that forward every year. Um, but other than that, I think that was the only major change. Yes. 
So I just have a quick question. So there's the summary page for the current year, and then we've got the 10-year plan. Mm -hmm. So I had a couple of comments on the summary page. Do we want to hold those until we go through the spreadsheet, or? When you say summary page, you mean the? Um, it's the report that lists each light, line oh, item no. with a description. No, we can start. If you want to start, if you have questions on that page, we could. OK. It, more just from a consistency. So I'm just going to follow along with where we are on the spreadsheet. So from a consistency standpoint, um, under equipment, when we get down to the end with the schools and the new buildings, in parentheses, um, Sonia, I think you put borrowing. So I didn't know on the fiber optic net for that 589 in the grayed out column of your summary, do we also, do we want to consistently put where it's borrowing? Does that make sense? What I'm asking. Are we looking at the same page? This one here? No. There's two documents. One is a spreadsheet, yep. and then one is the written summary that accompanies just the FY20. Oh. So that's why I was asking, do we want to kind of do the same time, or do you want me to save those comments for after? Are you talking about the summary that describes each individual project? Right. So like, it'll. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. let's go through that after because I think okay, there's going to be a great. lot of um, that was my question. language okay. cleanups on that e piece. Exactly. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so back to the so again, we updated the protective gear for the fire department under equipment to be in every year expenditures. I think it was ending at like FY27 before, so we just rolled that forward. On the next page, I don't think there were any changes here. Um, Again, a lot of the vehicles got pushed back to FY21, but we haven't shifted any of that around, so I believe that all stayed the same. Same thing with the next page. There weren't a lot of changes there, with, again, to the next five to 10 years. Um, under buildings. Nothing on this first page. We did talk about some stuff at South, Ash, South, South Amherst campus about future expenses, but um, nothing definitive at this point. Yeah. Andy, there's a question. Yes. So um, on line item 129, mm -hmm. so in the prior spreadsheet, the building envelope repairs was 25,000. Now yeah. it's 100,000. And on the energy conservation project, on the previous, it was 10,000, and now it's 17,985. So those are changes from the prior oh, spreadsheet yeah, so, and the request, yeah. So, so the building envelope, um, there was something that got freed up when we went through it. Do you want to? Yeah. Um, as we got closer to uh, refining this, we realized that the uh, 410 that we voted for Emerson Media um, the debt service for that wasn't going to happen in fiscal year 20. It was going to happen in 21. So we moved that debt out, which freed up some money. And um, the town manager wanted to put that into buildings so that it could cover an emergency for any of the buildings or something that got taken off the list for all town buildings, including schools. Schools, um, the libraries could be any of the buildings. So it was his decision to move that there, and then he wanted the um, he wanted to put 75 there, and then he wanted to put the bulk of that into the remainder of that into sustainability efforts. Okay, so that, yeah. that happened right after our last meeting. After we, we right. our last meeting, right. Okay, so I guess my question is like that's pretty significant to go from 25,000 to 100,000 for emergency repairs, and so I guess I just want to make sure that we as a committee, are, that's where we want to put the 75,000, and, well, and everybody's on board with that. Well, we took a lot of things off of individual building asks, uh, like the cabinets that are falling down at the police station. There were some things at the school we took off, so we figured this would be a flexible way to handle, with, handle all of that. Okay, so I... <clears throat> so last year, one of the library requests was to put aside $25,000 for emergency requests um, because that's what some of the other buildings, and we were told basically, no, we can't do that. But so is this now, and you said, so is this now that space, and does it, because we did have an emergency request this year, but we wound up funding it and not coming to JCPC, so I guess I'm just trying to understand how this works. I guess emergency request was the wrong phrase to use. It's basically to achieve some of the things that were already on this 
previous ask without having to go back and go through the whole program again. Uh, so what was taken off? Yeah, what was taken off to move this additional money under 129? Well, the, the, the one that comes off my comes at the top of my mind where it was the um, cabinetry that's falling off the wall at the police station. That was twenty five thousand dollar ask. That came off. What what line? I think the question is the, what the, line did the? It was debt, I believe that. Oh, it was the, debt service that we didn't need. So there's a prior year twenty. There was a project approved in the past that had a debt schedule, and the project hasn't started yet. So the debt schedule, so yeah. the projected debt needed to be pushed out a year. Um, so basically, when you start with the total levy available for capital, the first step is to subtract out the, the debt and the projected debt. Um, so one of the projected debt items got pushed out because it hasn't been started yet. If you look at previous reports, you'll see debt in there for, for Amherst Media, Meg, uh, Peg. I, I get the funding source. I just didn't, I don't see the cuts. That's what, like, the cuts that you're, like, I don't, when I track so, the So the schools, for example, the schools had 150000 in originally for ADA upgrades. That got trimmed back to $100,000. Um, the schools also had 150000 for water fixture uh, replacements, and that got trimmed back to 100000 So at least from the school perspective, those were two facility requests that got trimmed back. And not saying that this is going to that, but that, again, that's the kind of things that this would help cover. Yeah, I guess I'm just having a lot of difficulty with this rigorous process we just went through for however many weeks, you know, line by line, and then we're just throwing 75000 back in with, I, I just, that feels really strange to me. Yeah, one and then I... This is along the same lines. So in other words, some changes were made, cuts were taken from one place and put into another to create more of a pool that different groups could come, different departments and the schools and libraries could come to? No, after our last meeting here, we had like a $20,000 deficit that we had to come up with because of some changes that this body made. You made some cuts and what did you add? Money somewhere? Um, the citizen request for the Crocker Farm study. Right, the citizen request for the Crocker Farm study. So we had a $20,000 deficit that we were looking to fund maybe with old capital or something. But then we our debt estimates became more firm and we realized that we were not gonna have to pay the debt service for the audiovisual equipment for Amherst Media until fiscal year 2021. So we were able to move $100,000 of debt service out another year, which gave, which balanced, which gave us an extra $80,000 approximately. So we put it in the building envelope so that we could cover some of those things that were taken out of the capital plan for ease, not having to redo the whole capital plan. Is so Amherst Media on here? If you go to the first page. <laughs> So the area that would have gone down would be is it the current debt obligation or the proposed debt obligation. That's where that would have been uh, lumped into. Right, Sonia? I think I included the debt service. If you look at this page, it's the last page of the report that I handed out. That's the debt service, projected debt that we had in the beginning. You'll see. Amherst Media, in fiscal year 20, we had $102,000 there for um, principal and interest payments. Since, since then, recently, I've had a conversation with Amherst Media about their debt needs. They're not going to need the whole 410. It's about 175 that they're going to need to borrow. And they're not going to borrow, they're not going to start until July 1, so the debt service would not start until fiscal year 21. So not only did it shift 102000 from fiscal year 20, it reduced it in the, in the subsequent years because the debt is going to be lower. So I guess, um, and I, you, may not, you may not have an answer to this, because there's sort of two 
lines of inquiry or thought on this subject. One is really more about process and how this relates to what we've been doing, which I don't disagree with the observations, but that's, that's sort of one line of discussion. Another line of discussion is, is how, how we're thinking about the actual priority prioritization itself. So this is a line item, a building envelope prepares that's funded at $25,000 like every year in perpetuity into the future. And if in the best judgment of the professionals in the town, that's an appropriate number, then I would look at, I hate to call it a windfall because nothing's a windfall, right? I mean, it's a precious money and it's all um, tax dollars. But if we had another 75,000, then I go back to the observation I was making earlier during the CPAC discussion, where when you look out at the capital plan, w without increasing any line items, so if you hold constant the building envelope repairs at 25,000 per year, then you just see other, other priorities that are stacked up and are being delayed you know, year to year. And so you could easily look in here and look, for example, on the vehicles, and you could cobble together 75 or $80,000 of vehicles that have been requested for the last couple of years are stacked up now over the next couple of years to be replaced. No one's disagreeing. Whether, whenever there actually is a failure on the equipment, everyone's agreeing at some point it has to be replaced. And if we move the money there, we could at least knock down a couple of those items so that when we're going to that process next year, we've whittled away just a little bit more at things that we know are gonna be very hard for us to place down the road. Now that's obviously a judgment about prioritization. You can make an alternative judgment, and I'm just trying to think about, since we obviously didn't have that discussion here, I'm just trying to figure out if it's, if it's being funded at 25,000 a year every year, why is, that, why is that in fact more important than looking at some of these backlog of other investments and saying, let's knock some of these down and make a little more progress. And I just want to uh, reiterate here that this, what, this um, change was made after the last meeting that we had for JCPC. It's fully, we moved it around this way, it's fully up for discussion, it's just that's where we put it to balance this at this time. And I actually was looking for that line just as you brought it up, so. So we'll bring this okay. feedback back to the town manager again. That's the recommendation we got from him as to where to put the funds that were freed up. Um, but hearing the feedback um, from all of you, we'll bring that recommendation back to him, or the, the feedback back to him, and see if that changes his, uh, his thought process, where it should go. Yeah, I think that the, the, the questions do need to be divided between process and substance, and the process part of it is that um, if there was just a explanatory memo right at the top saying, that the proposal is being made to shift funds from one line to another for the following reasons and the following amounts, that would at least put us in a place where we could look at it. Um, so that would be the process part of it. And then the substance discussion follows. But we can't have the substance discussion if we don't know that the, you know, if the process part that points it to us to it doesn't happen. So I guess to simplify the process is that the, the need for debt service for fiscal year 20 reduced, which allowed extra money for projects. Right. Yes. And then of course the other thing is that there was some mention made about the um, Amherst Media and the borrowing that has been authorized, again, uh, which had to do with the contract with Comcast. But that's a unique bundle of money that can only serve a very limited set of purposes. So we, we, we just all need to understand that, and track, that it needs to be tracked separately because it is uh, very restricted in what we can use it for. You're not, are you, is that germane to this question of where the extra 75,000 or 80,000 goes? No, I think that they're actually separate pieces, but they that's both that's came. No, that's what I was assuming. I just wanted clarity yeah. on that. Okay. Yes. Why 
lot of this confusion also comes up because of the timing and the whole change in governance and, and one town meeting and all. Normally the budget's done back in January. That's a, our educated guess back in January what the budget's gonna be. We're getting closer and closer. We have um, more information comes in every day on what our numbers are gonna be. So we fine tune it. We're not used to doing that. We're used to giving you a budget and a capital plan based on solely estimates. So. We could have had this 102 sit here in the past, and then um, it would just close out to free cash at the end of the year because we wouldn't have had to use it for debt service. So because we have more time and we can adjust this, we just moved it to cover other projects. It's just, time, it's just a change for all of us. Yes. I, I'm confused. Sir. I apologize, questions, comments, it's, it's all gonna go in multiple things. So it looks like 75,000 was added to the building envelope repairs, 17 or so, 8,000 8, or so was added to energy conservation projects. These are general things. You were mentioning earlier that some of this could be used for building stuff that we pushed forward years. But what I don't see is those that were pushed forward years, including I think the one you mentioned of furniture for the police station, um, removed from FY21. It's still sitting there in FY21's funding. Um, hold on, and could, could something designated as building envelope repairs, and this goes to when we, you know, this might be more of a question for when the council passes the budget that the town manager does, do we pass a bottom line capital planning or are we passing these specific projects? Because if we are, I'm confused as to how something labeled building envelope repairs, how a cabinet replacement in the police station qualifies as a building envelope repair. So that, that's, that's specifically to you and then I think going to what Alex was saying in terms of process, maybe what we as JCPC need to be doing in a future year is not specifically saying here are the projects we wanna fund and here we're just pushing them out, but as we potentially move this project process forward when funding is not as solid, what we, we, we prioritize, I think you know NSF grants and other granting agencies do this, where they look at all 100 projects and they put, here's number one, here's number two, here's number three. We think the line is here, and if the line moves down, here's number 20, 21, and 22 that we want as first priority. So that, that's a comment towards sort of this whole group as to maybe we need to start actually putting a ranking on all the projects of this year, here's our ranking, and that line falls wherever the funding is. So I thought I'd throw that in too, but if you could answer the first question, I'd appreciate it. Well, the first question is, um, when we had town meeting, we would vote capital in two sections, equipment and then building and facilities. And it was bottom line and equipment. So we had a list and, and an estimated amount for all of these projects in there. But if one project costs more, and another project costs less, we had the flexibility to move the excess into the one that they needed a little more money because um, their estimates were too low. Same thing in buildings and facilities. And um, that's a question I have for council later on is how are we gonna vote these so that we can write the orders? Do we continue with the breakup of equipment, facilities, and building, or do we just do one number for capital? Of course, any borrowing has to be separate um, votes, but for uh, cash capital, that can be all one number, and then you have the flexibility if things come up to move it around. Answer? That, yeah, because that goes to do these line items matter in the end, and, and that answer is depends on how we vote it, but likely not necessarily because we'll be voting a bottom line number that that right. still gives the manager flexibility. So for the most part, we stay within the numbers that are voted by each category. Some, sometimes things come up and we have to use the money in other ways, but that's always transparent in all of our financials. I have a silly question that goes to that then. If 
I want a better term legally. It's the, it's the bottom line number that's authorized for a given year in a given master category, let's say, of item. Does that mean that the, the spreadsheet allocations between fiscal year are similarly not binding in that if you found yourself able or needing to move a line item up from one year or back to another year, that you do that? I'm just asking, literally, I'm asking the question because it follows on what Mandy was just asking around. You don't ever, I mean, I haven't seen things get moved up before, um, but sometimes a project may not be finished completely expended in that fiscal year, which just may take longer. Um, for example, like our security articles that the school gets, we replace doors. Sometimes we don't use it all, and that the year that it's here might be a, a year after. No, no, I understand that kind of stuff. I'm, just, I'm what I'm saying. I, I think I'm getting the answer I was looking for, but I'm just, I was just asking the question of whether these things were in the end uh, a matter of of clear sort of binding policy in terms of once they're voted, or whether they're more sort of inferential, like you think you're going to do X. And what you're telling, and I get the idea that for a million reasons, projects get delayed and you sometimes move FY20 projects to 21 or 22, but you're just saying it so you don't end up jiggling between out years. I don't have the wrong impression. We do have to stay within the, um, the votes here within reason. If we start moving money around to all these projects all the time and everything, the auditors are going to write us up on that. That's not really good financial practice. So we try to stay within the lines that are here. We close out old capital if there's money left over in there. We cannot cross fiscal years. You can't use fiscal year 18 and 19 combined unless it's for the same purpose, specifically in the plan. Yeah, just, yeah, like, yeah, so I, I get that this was all last minute and not ideal, but I guess the, the comment that I want to make is, you know, JCPC as a committee originated so that different departments of town weren't, you know, throwing each other under the bus and fighting over money. And so when I, when I see, you know, $75,000 put into sort of a, a general basket. I guess I'm, I'm assuming this is just sort of temporary and where where we put it. But my feedback to the town manager would be that I, I, I personally would prefer that we allocate it to, you know, if if the police department needs the cabinets or if you know wh whatever it is that makes more sense. Because I mean, the whole point of this committee is for us to sort of listen to all the departments and figure out the needs and and taking such a large sum and putting it into a basket to me is in direct contradiction to what we're trying to do to work together with the various departments so that everybody feels like they're getting a fair shake. And I know this was not the intent this year. I, I just, that would be my feedback. Yes, Sonia. I just want to note that we totally expected there'd be conversation about this and questions about this. It's just where we put it, we knew it would. And I, I, th I think, um, just to underline a point I made earlier, because I'm sort of tag teaming with the things that Alex is saying in terms of her perspective, but build, really building off of it again on the, the, one of the things that we've talked about and we've, we've been struggling with is this question of not just what are we doing this year, but how do we understand the investments that are made out of the next few years? And how do we look at the sort of larger projects that we know that the town is gonna be uh, dealing with in terms of funding? It, while also recognizing that we have just this, I hate to call it a backlog because it sounds like it's not being managed well, and I don't mean that. But there's just there's clearly a lot of documented need that needs to be chipped away. And so part of the comment I was making earlier about if, if this line item has been funded at 25,000 every year, and it is in the next year, a few years funded at 25, then my immediate thought is, well, I can see other items on this list that have been pushed out a year that I would like to see knocked down. I don't have a preference and I actually don't have, I'm not pushing something from the schools or something. It's, it's just, it's more a matter of saying, we've expressed, I think, a general concern about how we get a handle on ensuring that we're in a state of good repair on our, our maintenance and equipment over the next few years in light of very significant projects we're looking at. 
And so when I see an opportunity like this come up, similar, and pardon me for doing this, but similar to the difference between 10,000 and 50,000 for, for trail maintenance on CPA, I, I actually agree with the sentiment that any time those numbers come down or we don't see ourselves chipping away at things that we know are documented needs in the future, I worry not about this year, coming year, I worry about where does that put us in FY21 and 22, where we're just sort of building up a list of things that could potentially fail. And I'm, I'm not being, I, it sounds like I'm being critical, but I'm not, because I understand how this came up now. It, it's more a matter of, this is, the, this is what we're gonna be talking about in a moment, about like what are our recommendations, what are we looking at, and this is the biggest thing that's on my mind, is trying to figure out how this JCPC can play a useful role, and we can collectively work together to think about how we manage this large group of investments we need to chip away at, while we're also looking at greater needs that we know we also have. Yes. Okay, but I, I just want to reiterate that it's the timing now that we're dealing with where things are getting fine-tuned. In the past, the 102 would have just stayed there as debt service. It would have been adjusted in the overall budget. We would have put less in capital, cash capital, when we balanced the budget. We wouldn't have used that. It would have gone to the overall town, town school budget. So it's just a uh, change in how we do things, and we probably need to come up with a process if this ever comes up again. It's a learning experience <laughs> that we'll note for our improvements. So, um, I'll keep going because there's a, there's a yeah, couple more. I, I was just going to say, I think that's why us maybe in a future year looking at doing an actual priority list would help you when that money after we, especially if we move a JCPC process earlier before we know numbers, then you could look at it and go, oh, the next one on the list would fit. You know, and, and then you got that in, input from us. Okay. Thank you. So I am on the page now that starts with the police station, municipal buildings. Okay. So I believe the only changes here were down in the school buildings section um, in the interior upgrades. And the, we added the, so first thing, we added the uh, feasibility study for Crocker Farm. I don't think that was in the last version you saw, so that's been added as an FY20 project. Um, interior upgrades, um, FY21 and FY22 were increased from, I think it was 50,000 to 150,000. And down below, um, so when we moved the water fixtures and the ADA, we moved it up into interior upgrades for FY20 but we didn't do that for the out years for FY21 and FY22. Um, so to clean this up, we moved the out years up into interior upgrades as well. So it was, a, it was no net change in the plan, but it was moving it from specifically at schools into the district level interior upgrades. Yeah, uh, yeah, so, yeah, so just on the, um, the line 209 for the preliminary feasibility for the Crocker Farm study, yep. I think at the end, um, the person who, one of the people who brought it said that they thought the cost was more 30000 than 40000 Yeah, I mean, this is a budget at this point. Um, yeah. So until we actually put it out there, we're not going to know the exact cost. So you're right, it could come in less, and if it comes in less, um, then those funds just wouldn't be expended. It would um, be able to be used for future capital plans. All, all these numbers are budget, so none of these are going to, most likely none of these are going to be exact um, in the end. Um, I think I, it, this is just a main, it, it's under school buildings with a random thing. It's not under Crocker, it's not under new buildings. It kind of, I think our last conversation was maybe it gets folded into the new school feasibility at the 400 and maybe it's just a listed as 440 or 430 and yeah, we could put maybe it putting it close to that one, even sure. if you want to line it out separately, would be helpful so that we can see it all. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. On the other two, the AFD headquarter numbers were moved and changed to FY20, and I think Public Works was also... Yeah, I'm not on that page yet. Oh, okay. Oh, you haven't gotten to that no, page no. yet. Any, other qu any questions on this page? And those are the, some of the bigger changes that I'll talk about next. Well, the other thing that was there was when we had the last discussion about the North Amherst Library, it was... Uh, we suggested that since that was probably going to be borrowing, that it would be, um, it's a placeholder year where it is right now, unless it's up to the manager to um, 
make future recommendation as to whether it should be shifted to an earlier year and whether borrowing should be suggested in an earlier year, whether there's substantial reason to do that. Lynn? Yeah, I, I just, I'm trying to take notes, which during this conversation is, has to be about one of the worst jobs. <laughs> um, I want to go back to where you're talking about and just make sure I know where you are. And this is not for the purposes of notes, but it's for the purposes of the, of the conversation. So just where are we? For the North Amherst Library conversation? Yes. The one right, so this is on? Line item what? Uh, it's line item 199. 199. Okay. So we've moved that all the way out to FY22? No, I don't think that one was moved. I think the discussion last time was should it be moved forward based on um, the conversation that's happened at prior meetings. Okay. So this is not, this is not just a statement to the town manager, but, it's, but really um, in regard to the people who are proposing that they would like to raise money. I personally would like to see this moved to FY21. However, I also say to the people who have said they would like to raise money that would perhaps seriously reduce this amount, that they do so. They put it in a revocable account that is visible and for which we can have a statement that says, here's our money, it's cash on the barrel head, fine. You've put up some money, now we'll put up some money. It's not something that the town should do first and then hope that they come forward with the money they raise. So then on the next page, so again at Fort River and Wildwood, um, you'll see that there were amounts moved, or actually I think it was all three schools, but I can't remember if it was just uh, Fort River and Wildwood, but we moved the interior, uh, ADA upgrades and the uh, water fixtures up to the interior upgrade. Um, section under the district wide. Uh, but the major change was under new buildings. So Jones Library reconstruction, we pushed that back a year. Uh, originally FY22, um, I reviewed the, the most up to date timeline I have that had, I think, construction not starting until FY23. Um, so it doesn't make a whole huge difference, but push that back one year to FY23 for now. Uh, public Works facility we talked about last time. Um, having money in FY20 for the schematic design, so that's what the, the $250,000 chunk is. And then the balance is basically in line with our sort of preliminary ballpark number of a $30 million project there. Um, the fire station, um, again, this one had to be moved forward because based on our conversation last time, orig originally it was 500,000, I think, in FY21. Um, so we've split that up. We moved 250 forward for schematic design in FY20. Um, so that could be done at the same time as the DPW. Again, both of those are borrowings. Um, and that's a total project cost of 20 million. Um, the new school had some big changes to it. The, the number way low, if you recall, that we had in there is from the last time we had the school project. Um, so that was increased um, up to be a, roughly a $40 million project. Again, that's just a ballpark number. It could go up or down based on what ultimately happens, but it's closer to the number we, we've been talking about. Um, and again, based on the conversation we had last time, we talked about putting the feasibility study funding in FY20 in case it happens, um, just to have it there. Um, you know, whether things are debt exclusions or not debt exclusions are still to be determined. Um, so we can change the shading any color that you guys think makes sense, but um, the school project and the library project were two that have been talked about in the past. Um, and I think those were the major changes uh, for the buildings. Andy? Yes. Um, Unless the price of feasibility studies has gone up dramatically since the conversations that we had prior to going to previous town meetings, I don't see any reason to have the additional 250000 for the fire station in FY21. Okay, so you're, maybe I misconstrued your comments last time. You think the two fifty could be for both the DPW and the, the fire station? The estimate we've been given, again, these are estimates and they're now three or four years old for a feasibility study for a building of this nature was 250000 And that's what we had previously gone to town meeting for. Mm -hmm. Whether that's a realistic number or not anymore, I have no idea. I want to make sure they both stay in FY20, sure. but I don't see the reason for the one in FY21. 
Oh, sorry. So for the FY21, um, yeah, we could move that back. So originally there was 500,000 there. And so the question was, is the first piece sort of the schematic design, and then there's some uh, additional um, planning work that would happen in FY21, ultimately for a project to start in FY22. But we could move that back to FY22 so that it doesn't look kind of funny with two um, I guess what there. I'm saying is I'm not even sure I understand the need for it. E either 250 or just the second one? Just the second For one. fire station? Yeah. Um, no, we'll move it back. I mean, the total ties out to 20 million. So the ballpark number we have for the fire station was 20 million. So we're trying to keep it consistent with the numbers that have been out there. Um, but in terms of where it's slotted, we can move it back so it doesn't look like a separate chunk. I mean, it could be site prep, but you can't do site prep until the DPW people are kind of moving. Yeah, the timing of this was sort of the why it kind of came out funky is not knowing exactly how the dominoes are going to fall there. Sammy? I just want to um, state that this is called borrowing articles. So we wouldn't, you don't necessarily need to vote these borrowing art articles before July 1. It can wait until we're much closer to actually doing something, whether you know how much your feasibility study is really going to cost you. We can, these are just estimates for the capital plan to give us an idea or just to put it on paper so we don't forget about it like we're going to forget about it, right? <laughs> but it's, it can be fine-tuned later on. It does not have to be exact right now. Yeah. I'd just like Amy. to comment on moving the library. I mean, Oh, I have it on, yeah. But it, she had it for FY, I mean, 21 originally. Um, and you moved it to 22, but obviously that's, yeah, that could and I'll double check with her. I mean, the, again, the latest timeline I have had serious construction look like starting in 2023. Um, right, you moved it. To, but I'll double right, check again. That 22, yeah. yeah. But again, that number moving forward or backwards a year doesn't matter a whole lot. Can I ask one more clarifying question? Sorry. Yeah. On the, the Crocker Farm feasibility study, I think Mandy and I were thinking the same thing, and. I, maybe I'm misremembering, but I thought we weren't setting aside a line item of 40000 I thought we were sort of, and, and right now it's not shaded like it's borrowing. It's like it's a separate line item. So I guess, I, I don't know if I'm misremembering sort of how we ended up, but this makes it look like a funded separate line item instead of part of the overall feasibility study that's borrowing. Yeah, the, the way we have it is a separate item that would be cash um, funded. It wouldn't be borrowing. Um, and the discussion I remember, and it, I may be misremembering, is that it, it will help lead into a feasibility study. But if we do it before the feasibility starts, it would, because it potentially could start earlier um, if, they decide, if we decide to do it over the summer, um, then it, it's sort of its own item at that point. Um, and we wouldn't borrow for $40,000. Yeah, no, my, my memory actually, I mean, we, we had like a really robust discussion of this. And, um, and my memory is actually we talked about potentially rolling it into the feasibility study, but actually I thought there was actually a majority of the JCPC was saying, no, darn it, if we're going to do it, let's pay for it and call it out and say that it's going to be part of the budget. And so I think the, to me the real question, and I don't really – I don't want to say I don't care like I don't care. But I mean, I, I don't really care if you pick 40 or 30, depending on what you think it was. I thought the real issue was by the time we were done with the discussion, we thought 30 was a more realistic number than 40. Um, so, so I, but, I, but I think I was, pre, I thought we were becoming more clear that it would, be a, it would be a separate item. Yeah, 40 was the citizen's request. And then we got, a, um, I think, sort of an estimate from, I think it was TSKP that said, oh, it might be 30. It could be 30. Um, I think ultimately until we draft what we want somebody to do, it's hard to know exactly what the cost would be. I mean, um, we sort of have thoughts of the study we want them to do, but there may be other things we want them to look at at this. So I think 40, we were just trying to be more conservative, but again, we'll only spend what actually comes in. I have a question works, the $30 million for um, the year after this. Sure. Status with, with land. 
far as, hey, Lynn. Mm -hmm. We are still in search of land, but coming close. And so the, uh, and the reason we wanted to um, put this money in FY 20 is that if we are successful, and as Sonia's explained, this is an estimate on debt. Uh, if we are successful, then the best way to go about trimming the estimated cost of a building to see, therefore, what can we really build is to, once you have the land, is to do schematic design. And schematic design is when you can say, no, we're not gonna do that over there, or we're gonna stage this for another year. So it's really dependent on land. You're absolutely correct there, but we're honing in. Yeah, and, and the only Thank thing you. definite about those lines is probably the, the schematic design piece. The projects themselves will just keep going backwards until the, the plan is um, in place as to what we're gonna do. Makes sense. So, so I have a question that doesn't really relate to anything. For FY20 per se, we have a line for ambulance fund throughout this entire, for shading, for everything. It has zero in it under funding and it has nothing shaded. Should some of the ambulance purchases be shaded? With, you know, so I always thought some question. of them were paid yeah. for and why are we not shading anything for it or even showing we have funds available from ambulance fund? So I can't remember if this was a change after our last meeting or before our last meeting, but there used to be a lot funded in this plan from ambulance funds. I think it was two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars ish, um, spread over several years. Um, because of the change with Hadley, um, there's not as much money that's in that fund. So the amount that's available for capital is going to be. I mean, there's still future decisions that have to be made, but in general, the planning right now is that there won't be money available for capital um, from the ambulance fund. So, so that so that was a change from probably the very first version that we saw that had some numbers in there for amb ambulance fund receipts that um, are likely not going to be available for capital items. So the future ambulance purchases are going to need to come out of regular capital funds. Town. That's all factored into the when you look at the front page and the future deficits between um, available resources and spending. Um, that's impacting that gap that we have there. And then the other change I'll just point out real quickly is in roads. So we, um, we kept the investment in roads, um, non-Chapter 70 or ch Chapter 90 uh, investment. Um, it's a million dollars up until FY24, and then we dropped it down to 800,000 um, there and after. So um, again, the thought process there was the uh, guidance we've received is that we need to put about $2 million a, a year into roads. I think it was for the next six or seven years. Um, or it was for six or seven years total, and so this, and we dropped that down a little bit, um, realizing that there's still a need for road to invest heavily in roads, but that we've got all these other needs as well. And we also put the housing production plan back in. It was a request last time to put that back in with the alternative funding source. So on the very last page, you'll see the housing production plan is restored, but with a different funding source. Um, the front page, and I know we haven't been discussing the summary page, has the percent a levy of capital equals nine and a half straight through. Are we, I, I think our goal was next year I guess FY21 would be increased to 10 and then keep 10 all the way through. Should this summary page sort of show that increase so or the, is there it's a three reason? quarters of the way down the page. Um, oh, yeah, so sorry it shows, about that. No, it's okay. I totally it shows, missed that. It shows hypothetically if we do get to 10, then what the gap would be in the future, but you're, you're exactly right. Yeah. Uh, this, this is kind of a, uh, it's a question to the town manager and all of you uh, that, uh, that with the town, and that is when we do the um, meeting, which I believe is scheduled for June 10th, on the immediate capital and the five-year capital and so forth, what will this sheet be altered or what will be presented? 
we're still working on it. Um, I think if we're going to focus on five years, then we'll probably trim it down to five years, but we're still sort of under development, but we welcome your thoughts now if, it, if you've got input into that. So again, I, I want to go back to messages we're sending, mm -hmm. okay? And one has been raised about when was the library request for, was it, was, was it for two, FY22 or FY21? And then the other one is what, whether or not we should move the North Amherst Library up from 22 to 21. And it's, it's a, I think this is a critical year for us to begin sending messages about desire because then reality is going to hit and we'll get to the use of the model and that's going to inform the public uh, with a lot of information about what's desired versus what's doable. I tend to share that concern. I think we have lots of needs, both for things we keep pushing back, for example, vehicles, um, roads, which we keep, uh, we, we know is a continuing demand. We're putting chunks into it, but it's in the, the hate to use the expression, the hole we're trying to fill is quite large. And uh, then we uh, also are talking about maintaining current facilities and building new buildings and not letting new buildings fall into um, lack of maintenance um, to make sure that we protect our new assets that we're building. So we've got a lot out there and uh, trying to balance all of it. I'm not sure that our thought process really has gone far enough into that. It's, I, I, I agree that, I mean, that's a plumb line probably in every comment I've made today during the meeting has been about trying to think not just about this year, but out years. And, and, and I think it's, rel it's, in some ways, I think it is relevant to a discussion of the FY20 plan, the five-year plan, what's presented publicly and what you end up voting, voting on as a, as a council is trying to figure out how to do that in a way that's looking at these, these larger projects in the town, but also thinking about how, to, how the conversation is managed around these other you know, sort of stacked needs. And it's something the town manager had said um, at our last meeting or the one prior to that about uh, echoing uh, a process that the schools had done around uh, trying to really dig in within the capital requests to um, start, put something Mandy Joe just mentioned a while ago too, start to figure out how to stratify the, the level of urgency of some of the requests that are coming in. And I, I say that in light of the, I mean, so how we approach that or how town manager is gonna approach that with the departments, I think is probably a really important thing for the council to have presented to you to understand in light of this budget because if I were looking, I, maybe I'm not smart enough. If I sit here long enough, week after week, at least I eventually get smart enough to look at the spreadsheet and say, oh my God, look at all the deferred things. And the part of the conversation we had, um, you know, a month ago now was actually, this is both sort of better and worse than it looks simultaneously. On the one hand, it is genuinely daunting and there is in fact more, there are in fact more requests than there are, there is money to pay for it. And then on the other hand, once you start digging under the hood around, you know, what, how long can a vehicle last? When is it really likely to break down? When is it not? Once you start getting into that, then you realize, well, wait a minute, you know, it's one thing to say something's again at the end of its book usable life. It's another thing to actually understand, you know, where, what is our actual hit list of things we need to knock down in terms of vehicle acquisition. And that list is going to look different than it does on the spreadsheet. And I think the closer that between the professional leadership of the town and the elected leadership of the town, there can be a good dialogue around what these needs really look like 
it'll, I think it'll inform the same discussion that Lynn, you were talking about a moment ago of helping the town really wrestle with where are we actually and where are we gonna, what are we gonna need to do over the next couple of years and how do we get better information to manage and facilitate that conversation. Andy? So, uh, CPA has a line for coloring. None of that funding for recommendation is in here right now. Um, it will eventually go in. Um, so it would be great to be able to see things like Groff Park has CPA funding. We're not just completely ignoring it because right now Groff Park has nothing for 10 years. Um, but I also, there's a grant funded line and I know we've talked about this before as a way to, how do we show that all of that borrowing in terms of debt exclusion of 39, you know, or, or those numbers, where do we show the MSBA match and you know or with the CPA land grant acquisition where they just testified that there was 400,000 coming for a land grant where do we show that as a way to show the public that we're getting substantial funds from other resources to help do this so I, I don't know the best way to do it on this spreadsheet but figuring out a way to show those MSBA funds potential funds you know the the potential library, the land grants, the park grants, all of that would be, I think, very helpful. That actually reminded me of another thing I wanted to point out, and it's worth discussion here as to how we should present this going forward. So the, the library actually, in the prior version, had, it had the town amount, but it also had in there um, the amount to be fundraised. And the question is, should we to be consistent with the other projects, we're really only putting in the town share. Um, so I took out the amount for, that's projected to be fundraised, but it's up for discussion as where, whether you think that should stay in um, and whether it should be shaded as an alternative funding source or the town should be preparing to fund that if the fundraising isn't what it's projected to be. Um, so that was, in the prior plan, it had both the town share and a, a projection for private fundraising and some tax credits and things like that. Since I honestly believe we can't do all of these projects if we don't get those outside funds, mm -hmm. I would strongly urge that we figure out a way to show the expectation or the hope of those funds because, again, our opportunity now is to use a year-long process, if that's what it's going to take, to finally have a full and complete discussion with the public about all of our capital needs in a way that our previous um, opportunities were not there. Also, it's not reflected on here what the MBLC is contributing. That's another yeah. Yeah. yeah, both would be added back. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, well, in other words, the, the actual cost here is only the town or the fundraising piece. It's not the money coming from the state, which is important for the public to understand that. Right. Can I, can I piggyback on that? That, and I know this is challenging because also you end up getting every color in the rainbow on the on these uh, spreadsheets. After you while, know, I like to shade things. Is that you, if we're going? To, I mean, I agree with what Lynn said about showing future outside grant sources, but then you've got to figure out how do you differentiate between known sources of funding outs and then projected or hoped for sources of funding because the last thing you want people doing is looking at a spreadsheet and either doing one of two things, either saying, well, isn't the council stupid because they think they have money they don't really have, which of course isn't true, but people might say that. And then the other one is just saying, I'm confused. When you say you have an outside grant, do you have it? You know what I mean? So just being clear about what's actually no. under contract or at least has been an awarded or whatever initially awarded versus what we're hoping we're gonna get but we don't actually know yet. Yeah, and a similar, well, similar example is the, li the North Amherst Library. Um, right now, potential funding of, uh, from another source isn't in here at all. We don't know what that number is, but um, that's another one that could potentially be adjusted in the future. I mean, as, as with the schools, if we don't raise money in the town privately and from town funds, we won't get the MBLC money. So it's, it's that same dynamic, so that's it's hard to reflect that. I don't know whether it needs to be footnotes or something um, that indicates what the total cost is, but 
the state money won't come unless the town appropriates the amount needed, fortunately. And it's a chicken and egg problem because it goes the other way too. The town is relying on the Board of Library Commissioners and then the fundraising piece is also a part of it. And so if we're gonna give an accurate description to the public, it all has to be there. So any other questions on <laughs> in the five to 10 year plan. Um, is there a way in the, um, I guess it's like the, I'm, I'm looking at the Fort River and the Wildwood sort of numbers, particularly the Fort River number um, of, you know, replacement windows that in two years is $800,000 in FY 26 and 27 and all. Is, and, and I know this doesn't even have at all similar items for the library if the library's not renovated with MBL MBLC money, but yet we're showing some for Fort River, if that yeah. doesn't, is there a way to either <laughs> include the library numbers, but then take those numbers somewhere on a different line on the summary and say, hey, if the schools are redone, these numbers disappear. Sure. You know, If the library is redone, these out numbers disappear, so here's what your FY26 requests kind of looks like if this capital project, major capital project is funded and here's what it looks like if that one's not. I, again, I don't know how you would do that you know, in terms, but I think it could be done in a way that shows us a more realistic if we do end up doing a library, if we do end up doing that school, what those school maintenance costs are 10 years out. Yeah, we, and we've, I mean, we've, so we did that for the school process. Uh, before it got here, we did that with the schools. We showed if we get the new building, um, here's the cost that we would not need a request. If we don't, then we're keeping it on here because, um, so how to do that on here is something we'll have to um, grapple with, but it's a good point. Well, yeah, the library, if the library funding does not. I think it was what, 10 million? Pass, or 10 million? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's 10 million, but that doesn't even include the ABA compliance. Okay. That only includes basic maintenance, deferred maintenance. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll check with Sharon on yeah. that one. I think, we, I, I, I think we're getting to a point where we probably um, really need to be thinking about having one or two members of this committee work with Sean outside of this committee process or this committee meeting and then uh, come back to it because we're identifying a series of problems and um, we want to be transparent to the public in what we're doing and what the choices are um, without being able to say clearly that if we don't do the library major project that we're talking about, this is how much we're gonna have to spend on the library and have that as a number that so that people realize that um, there's gonna be costs to not doing it um, and what those costs are. We're not showing that right now. Um, and uh, we need to be able to do that both for our own planning purposes, realizing that it's gonna be one or the other, but also to the public. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I was just going to say the, the challenge, and we've talked about this thoroughly within the school committee, and I think some here too. The challenge on the schools is it really isn't just an either or, is that it's very, I mean, you already know this, but I'm just saying it for the purposes of our discussion. It's really super meaningful whether we get into the, the MSBA program this year versus other years, because some of the repairs that are being listed, most of the repairs that are being listed for, the, for Wildwood and Fort River, um, will have to be done and we'll have to pay for a new school. It's not one or the other. If we, if we don't get into FY 22 or 23, we're gonna be doing both things and paying for both because of the state of repair of the buildings and the, where you might get failures in the buildings between now and then. Um, so I, and I, I don't wanna put a fine point on it because I just don't know the council certainly is well aware of that. Yeah, Liz. The, the other piece, and I, I, Sean, I just, and 
Paul and Sonia, I don't know how you do this, but one of the things that, I mean, we literally heard this last night in the district meeting, and that is to have a way in which we look at a new building and say, what is the ratio or formula that we need to have in a fund to make sure that that building does not deteriorate to the extent that our present buildings have done so? So what is our ongoing maintenance of a new building? So. My practical mind is playing here, and I'm thinking of all the changes that we want to make to the report, whether we have enough time to do that. We have to submit this by May 1st to the council, which is next Wednesday. So I think we can get some of the changes that were talked about in this report done, but not everything. So um, I think you need to prioritize what you want changed so we can get it done and get the report submitted and hope for a much better report next year. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think the questions I've heard, I don't think we're gonna have time to like create a new workbook that reflects everything you're asking, but I think we can try to answer those questions in the presentation um, separately, um, or at least give some what our thoughts are at the time on, on those questions. But you're, in terms of doing the whole workbook, that's gonna take more time. From my point of view, it would be great to answer those questions and then maybe as finance committee works on other things, not wait till next spring to have a new way of showing this, present it whenever it might get ready as we work on doing that so that we can start getting out to the public in a, in a way. Yeah, and, and I think to what Andy had um, uh, mentioned before about maybe a couple members working offline, it, it could include that as well, a couple members kind of working with us on that workbook and giving feedback in real time um, so that it's ready to go for next year. So is there any... Yeah. Yeah, Anthony. Just a minor note, lines 218, 229, and 239 use univentilor. Um, my discussion with Rupert is that it should be unit ventilator, and that's not a term that's used anywhere, so. Thank you, yeah, Ms. misspelling. Yeah. Sure, I'm just one, I'm noting the time. I am too. And just. Uh, well, no, I, I, it's a practical matter. I didn't know what guidance you had for the committee around what we're going to try to get done in today and how much longer we'll go. Andy, can I recommend two quick things? Yes, go ahead. Um, one, I, you know, um, I already saw a few edits. If people have edits to the um, project listing for FY20 the, that actually has the project description, um, if you want, people could just send those edits directly because a lot of it's just clarifying um, what we talked about. So that's one thing. And then also the feedback we discussed last time, or talked about getting more feedback, and I've got a lot of it today. Um, but if there's other feedback that people have in terms of what they like about the existing plan, what they want to fix, um, and new things that you might want to see added, that's another thing you could send offline. We could compile, and, and if we have another meeting, we could bring it all back, sort of compile at, the, at that point. So, I, Alex, go ahead. No. I, I was just going to say, on, on the, there were a couple of edits that I can send in an email that just for consistency's sake, but um, the only one that uh, is on page one, the library information technology, you have is 10,000, but it's really 26,800, so that's an actual number. Um, and I can send the other comments uh, that are more, yeah, consistency or verbiage. So I think that we're at as practical matter because we are running out of time and I do want to, I, we do need to have a moment for public comment in the, uh, but we probably need, Alex and I probably need to work on a revised version of the report, um, the, narr uh, the narrative and uh, see if we can bring it in alignment with the discussion today and uh, the, um, I think that your point is, is the spreadsheet, the, we can do the best we can, but there's a limit to how much we're gonna be able to bring that into alignment in, in this year. We do need to be very clear about what it is that we're recommending, what our FY20 recommendations are, and that is just a list. I don't think that it needs to be 
uh, we can tie it to motions if we're going to do separate motions, but ultimately it's going to be presented by the manager as a uh, part of the budget for FY20, so we want to make it aligned to what the budget recommendations for FY20 are. This is what we're recommending to be included for capital and have that as a concrete list. So I think that those are the pieces that we're at. Does that seem right to the committee? And so. Yeah, I, um, in terms of working on the spreadsheet, I'm more than willing to do that and feel that I need to do that since we will be, and we've already posted the June 10th public forum and uh, clearly as president that that's a major responsibility for both me and the town manager. In the, uh, the years beyond FY20 are important for that right. process and that public discussion. Um, so we need to get that clarified, but it is different from the you know, what, what's most important is we need to get the budget. And I think that we really do have the FY20. We're, we're not suggesting real changes to the FY20 recommendations. No, the only question, again, is what to do with the, the um, building envelope additional funds, which, again, we'll, we'll work, work on that. But I think that was the only change to the FY20 um, piece. So is there a, um, any proposal for what to do about the presentation of the envelope since that is the one piece of FY20. Yeah, Alex. I, I don't know if the town manager is amenable, but I, for me it would just simply an explanation of here was my thinking over the other things that we cut, I, I guess is the only thing I would be interested in. It, it, doesn't happen to hap it doesn't need to happen now, but that you know we had other items that we cut or that we pushed out as Eric's talked about and we put off other years and, and just just understanding the logic of, of where the money's going would be great. Okay. I'm not hearing anything, seeing anybody asking for recognition. Um, so. Did you ask for public comment? Yeah. So I'm going to go back now and ask for public comment and um, see if there's any. Uh, thing to be said uh, afterwards and uh, then we'll uh, make a decision about how to proceed. Uh, Kathy? Kathy Shane, um, I'll just make them briefly uh, because I will have an opportunity to comment again as a member of the Finance Committee. Um, I'm mainly looking at out years um, and thinking the way this looks visually. I believe on the North Amherst Library, the discussions that have been going on are on the much smaller project. They had received some feedback, including the donors, on library preferring the one that doesn't have a major expansion that would require operating costs, so the number is potentially lower. So in addition to what was mentioned that there might be private funds that brings the town share down, I think the total project could be lower. So it just would be worth getting that information to pencil it in at a potentially lower number. Um, for out year projects that potentially have grants or we think we've applied for grants, the middle school roof, I would put in the same category as the school where there's a MSBA grant. So it instead of it going in as three million, going in as half of that with whatever you're gonna do to indicate this is grant pending. Um, then the uh, permanent bridge is the same at Station Road, I believe is the same that we're intending on applying for a grant for that. So if we're doing the town share, if we get a grant, it should go in at a lower number. It will help the way the whole sheet looks if we're doing that for some of these out year items. Um, then the other comment I had on out years on the interaction with CPA See, and I'm not sure how this could be done. Since you can see that funds can be used for recreational areas, 
when you get out to conservation and recreational areas, there's a large chunk of money for Puffer's Pond and for Mill River. So if it would be possible to be drawing on CPA on those projects, you know, thinking about these two together. Um, on the very first sheet, it says CPA funds as potential sources, and then later on, potential uses, you know, so however that gets shown, you know, but that being thinking about that, because that first page when I got it, um, what my eyes went down to is the net net in the out years where we're negative six million, negative five million, and that's with two debt service overruns. So that's not with the town absorbing all of this. So I think if this is a long-term capital plan, we have to, when we're talking about it, have some way of talking about it because we can't actually be in a deficit of $6 million, as I understand it. So just whatever we can do to the out years to get them as realistic as possible with this interaction or lack of interaction, I strongly encourage us to do it. Any other? Yes. Chris Hockman. Uh, two ob observations. Uh, one related to the uh, capital request process as it occurred uh, this year and ongoing years. Um, my observation would be that it would be helpful to have the process not limited to a early 2020 to a deadline point. Have it all year long allow submissions uh, throughout that time, uh, post those submissions so that department heads, proactive department heads, can monitor the requests, the feedback coming from the concerned citizens, uh, and then perhaps incorporate it into their budget request or perhaps take advantage of funding as it becomes available through unforeseen grants or unforeseen opportunities. Uh, second observation, uh, relates to the 10-year capital plan. Uh, upon review of the street scan 2017 uh, results, the most recent that I can see, uh, the concerns of those who drafted that uh, were indicated that there were 22 miles of Amherst roads, approximately 22%, uh, needing reclamation, which is basically reconstruction. Uh, at, at, at very conservative estimates, a million dollars a mile to do those reconstructions or reclamations. Uh, that is uh, the, the numbers given for a 10-year uh, outlay, uh, including Chapter 90 and uh, general fund, uh, will never, will never ac accomplish what the uh, study creators, the, 20, the street scan individuals that, that we hire here, that are hired here, uh, recommend. Uh, it needs to be a, a significantly larger number. I know that's not pleasant to hear. Thank you. And uh, just want to clarify, um, you are not a resident of Amherst. I am a, I am a resident of the four towns. Uh, yes, uh, but as you're a resident of Pelham. Correct. Yeah, correct. Thank Affirmative. You. Yep. Okay. Thank yep. you. My children go to school here. Um, the uh, appreciate the comments and um, we will have to take them under consideration I think at this point um, we, we is the committee available to meet next week anybody or let me just we have to meet before, to, before Wednesday we'd have to meet before Wednesday see you Wednesday looking at the town manager going, and which midnight oil are you planning to burn to get that budget to us? What's the agenda for the next meeting? Is it, would it be just to work more on process improvements or would it be to actually vote the FY20 piece? Um, I, I think we need a meeting to approve the report and vote FY, whatever it would be, the 20. I think we need a separate meeting, maybe June, July, yeah. to talk about next year's process, separate that out completely after this year is done. I think but that the, uh, maybe there is two separate questions. One is, can we just take a vote now on the FY20 recommendations and um, 
so that they get firmly planted. Um, we really have completed the work on that. And if we can uh, have that as a simple motion, that would allow us to at least say that we've completed that piece of work. Then we're back to the report. And there's part of the report that needs to be done uh, promptly, but it isn't, doesn't have the May 1st deadline, I don't think. Um, and so we could put it off and just meet a week from today at our normal time. Um, just, I'm prepared to make the motion. Would you, based on previous experience, uh, suggest what it should look like? I was just going to comment the library yeah. trustees have a meeting next Thursday at 9 a.m. So we, we wouldn't be available. We, we, we usually meet, but we put it off for JCPC, which we thought was done. So I can, we'd have to reschedule our trustees meeting or pick a different date. Unless there's, yes, Paul. So the way. The way I understand is JCPC provides advice to the town manager. Town manager has to submit the capital plan on May 1st. So I'm hoping that you would act today, maybe to final you know, nuanced changes by the chair or whoever, so that I can submit something with your advice prior to by, on May 1st. I think that's the goal of this process at this point in time. And when you're saying that, are you specifically referring to the FY20 recommendations are you looking for um, something on the longer range plan the charter calls for a five-year capital plan capital improvement plan plus the FY 20 capital plan so it, it would be both and I I mean I think you're there honestly uh, with the changes I think there are some nuanced changes concerning the major capital projects that typically I don't recall that being included in this capital plan in the past, but I think, think people, it was wise to include it because people want to see how this all fits together. Um, but there are so many iterations to it in the sense of do we have grants or not? What if we don't get the, the what if we don't do it, then we have these deferred maintenance things we have to invest in. Those are sort of changes that we can make as, as we develop the plan further. But I think the urgency at this point is to deliver a product to the council on May 1st. Yes, Alex. I think at the beginning of this process, we had talked about the need to have more information on the major capital products projects and maybe putting them as an appendices. So I'm wondering, does it make sense at this point to approve a five-year with those removed, which, get, which buys us the time to put together the appendices for the more detailed way that we want to present it? I mean, if I, I don't know if that makes sense or not. Yes. Uh, another way to do it is to categorize them as for information purposes. For, you know, not even like this is where, this is our best estimate at this point in time, but we know the council is gonna be spending the next six months playing with the tool and sort of figuring things out. It's, it's a, I think that's, you know. Yeah, that is a problem. I, I think if we <clears throat> today vote sort of the, the five year portion of the 10 year we saw today as a recommendation to the town manager. I don't think we need to report the, as, as the town manager said, the charter just requires that the manager, with the advice of us, um, submit a four-part capital improvement program. The, we've, I think, with that chart, give him advice on at least three of the four items, and the fourth one is something that doesn't really deal with us, which is the estimated annual cost of operating and maintaining the facilities and equipment included in that five-year plan. Um, but the other three are the summary of the contents, which is there in the spreadsheet, the list of the capital improvements proposed to be undertaken during the five years, that's there, um, and the cost estimates method of financing and recommended time schedules, again, that's there in that spreadsheet. If we can maybe vote the concept of the spreadsheet with potential changes to it, I think we have will have provided the advice needed and necessary under the charter without needing to vote the report today. And if we can get that report to the council prior to the hearing, I, would that then satisfy the manager's needs to get it to the council by May 1 and then JCPC submits a report later? 
Well, I, technically, JCPC would terminate on May 1. You, your, your mission will have been accomplished. You've delivered advice to the town manager. If that's how I read, that's how I read the mission of the JCPC. If you think that it has a broader mandate, I'd be interested to hear that. I think the, uh, the, the other piece, the, the reason that the committee might continue to have one more meeting is the process for next year, that we really feel like that there have been some serious problems that came up this year that nobody's putting, pointing fingers about, but it's just a matter of the change in government got us there to where we are now. And we would like to see things done differently for next year um, based upon what we've learned and also what you weren't here earlier when uh, Nate Buddington was here, but um, closer relationship with uh, CPAC. So those kinds of things we still can work on. But it would seem to me that we should probably um, vote on the FY20 recommendations um, as they are now formulated. Um, and then a se um, secondly, vote on a five-year plan to be developed um, and uh, with uh, ultimately giving the chair and the vice chair the uh, um, authority to approve that and that the understanding is that the amount that is going to be shown for major projects will be consistently presented as the current estimate of what the town contribution to those projects are with the understanding that there are other portions that will um, be expected to come either from private donations or um, grants and that um, to be consistent that those will be excluded from the, the plan uh, which will only cover the town portion. Let's take the first motion, and that is to recommend to the town manager the FY20 recommendations, JCPC recommendations, as they are now formulated. I will move that one back. And is there a second? I'll second. Any further discussion on that motion? All in favor, then, indicate by raising hands. So it's unanimous. And Sec secondly, we need to and do one absent. with one absent. And, uh, and I move uh, that the Joint Capital Planning Committee approve the five year capital plan recommendations and further delegate to the chair and vice chair of, of the Joint Capital Planning Committee uh, any further refinements as discussed. Could you, could you restate that? I'm sorry. You <laughs> I move that the Joint Capital Planning Committee uh, approve the five-year capital plan recommendations to the town manager and further that the Joint Capital Planning Committee delegate to the chair and vice chair further refinements to that plan as discussed. I'll second. I'm sorry, what did you say? <laughs> I've, as we discussed at the last meeting, I've been taking minutes. You two guys can get together. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> yes. I would just like to request that the library funds be put where Sharon Sherry had requested them in her request. Yeah, we'll double check with her. Again, that number I think was there from prior I don't think that was part of her request. I think that was there from last time, but we'll double check what year it should be. No, I have her request that she requested, and I have a spreadsheet that lists. Again, I'll connect with her as when anticipated construction is to start. Mr. Chair? I must yes. I, with the last part of the motion that had been seconded that said added discussed, I was assuming that there had been some tally of some of the changed recommendations to the five-year plan that could be reflected in the refinements that the chair and vice chair were going to go over? Yeah, and that was one of them. Right. That's right. one of them. Right. right. And um, the, the other thing that uh, 
we have an understanding that, uh, just to make confirm it, that, that the five-year plan will very explicitly show that it is only the town portion that is there, that we expect other funds will be provided um, in order before the construction would actually proceed, uh, but for presentation purposes, it is only showing the town portion. And um, I think that we, uh, And leave it at, at that, re recognizing that borrowing would have to be approved and there's numbers of steps that would have to take place before it would actually be there. This is a planning document. So, we have a motion, and we do have a second, I believe. So, uh, further discussion? All in favor? Again, looks like unanimous with one member absent. Uh, so at that point, I think that where we're at is that um, Alex and I will uh, work on the report section together, um, consistent with the motions that have been passed, and that we will not schedule an immediate meeting, but plan on having a meeting uh, after a little bit of pause in time to catch our breath and get this out of the way in order to take, um, think about the process that we want to recommend for next year. So it and won't be next week? Will not be next okay. week. How do we? Yes, Sean. And if it's okay um, with the chair sending the edits to like the project listing, some of the technical edits to that language so we can get that cleaned up um, for the FY20 projects. Yes. Anything else? Um, I think we have no minutes at this point to consider. Um, I, I submitted the minutes from the April 4th meeting. I don't think we've we, reviewed them. We haven't had a chance to read. Do you want to make a motion that somebody be designated to approve minutes? Sure. I'll, I'll move that the chair of JCPC be designated to approve our outstanding minutes. I second. It is motion made and seconded. Any discussion? It is now an allowable procedure. Um, so all in favor indicate by raising hands. And uh, unanimous with one member absent. So we will schedule another meeting to, uh, but not immediately, in order to talk about recommendations for next year's process. Uh, is there anything else that people would like to raise? If not, then I'll hear a motion to adjourn all your work as chair. It's been an interesting year. Thank um, you. I also want to, again, thank the staff of the town and the um, town manager. We've um, run you through your paces. And um, for that, we apologize. But on behalf of the public, it's kind of what we have to do. Thank you so much for all your hard work. So. Move to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. I Second. Okay. Well, then I'll note that we're adjourned at ten fifty-five.